Today's speaker is Keith Cooper, CEO at Constant Therapy, a company revolution, revolutionizing the treatment of neurological disorders using science-based digital therapy on mobile devices. And, by the way, a winner of the New England Innovation Awards in 2016. Prior to Constant Therapy, Keith was CEO of uh, Conotate, president of Carbonite, also a winner of the New England Innovation Awards in 2010. There's a theme going here. CEO of Webhancer, CEO of Faxnet, GM of Transnational Communications. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School and Harvard College and president of the Harvard Rugby Club. Please welcome Keith Cooper. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> so Don, I'd like you to come to my company to give us a fishing lesson because when I got that email after I won the Espain competition a few months ago from Neil saying, Keith, I love you, I never should have clicked on it. <laughs> so uh, just hearkening back to the contest, I just want to say, uh, having been involved in many of these on both the judging side and on the competition side, uh, the Espain contest uh, and innovation awards process, uh, ceremony, people uh, are, are uh, top notch bar none. Uh, it's so well run from the application process to the initial presentation, to the venues, to the food, to the um, finalist uh, presentations and everything that goes on there. So kudos to Todd and the team for pulling together those awesome events. That's one of the reasons that I'm here. So thank you, Todd. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about entrepreneurship and the big pivot. I hear about 3.9% unemployment rates and I keep losing my job, right? So I j tend to start or take over companies, run them for three or four years, uh, and then uh, sell them or take them public if everything goes well. And in these processes, six companies over the last 30 years, uh, I've learned a lot about what goes well and what does not go well. And over the years, I just kept compiling these lessons about those things that did not go well and how we dealt with them as a management team, as investors, uh, and as employees, and I want to share some of that with you today. It's just a series of stories that I hope will be interesting for you uh, from uh, my companies uh, over the years, and at the end, we'll um, feel free to take questions and so forth, and I've got about 20 minutes or so. Perfect. So entrepreneurship in the big uh, pivot. The only thing, when I write a business plan or when I write a check uh, to uh, fund a business, the only thing of which I'm truly certain is that what's in that plan is not going to happen. It's just a fact. Now, I don't say that necessarily to the investors that are gonna write the check, right? Because that's a little bit of a bummer. But the fact is, the only thing I know is that's not gonna happen. Uh, the facts of business are that the ideas that you have will change and evolve, markets will shift, competitors will come in and arise in ways that you don't anticipate. You learn the truth about how good your product is or what needs to change. So change is inevitable and the lessons that I want to impart and that I've learned over the years are, don't fear it, don't fight it, it's just gonna happen, right? So you sort of have to roll with it. Although often painful, change is good. Change reinvigorates an organization, reinvigorates a strategy, often can lead to things that were better than you had originally planned. And to turn adversity into advantage, determine what's good about the new situation. It's really hard to do, because at times you're freaking out. But if you can find what's good in that new situation, you can pivot, evolve, and turn that into something positive. So Winston Churchill wasn't necessarily the smartest guy in the world, but he's definitely the most quotable. And one of the quotes I like best is, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but perhaps it is the end of the beginning, right? This, this sort of gives me comfort. This is like a refresh. It's not that the, uh, the incident that came up or the thing that you didn't expect is going to end the game. It's just a refresh, right? You can start again, the end of the beginning. I like that. So I'm gonna talk about some examples of the power of that pivot. This first one is a company called About Face. You've never heard of it, because it didn't survive. I had sold a company, I had a little bit of money, and somebody said, you should do some of this angel investing. Everybody's making some money about it. And I went, okay. So I started to see people, started to see young entrepreneurs coming in, I started to write some checks, right? Sort of careless. 
So this guy came into my office. His name is Adam. I won't give you his last name yet. And he said, I've got this plan for this company called About Face. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's a corporate social intranet. I said, what's that? And he said, well, we're going to put in the computer system everybody's name, their wife's name, their husband's name, their dog's name, their interests. And we're going to put it all in a place where people can go in the company and look at it. I said, OK, so why? And he said, you're CEO of a company. He said, wouldn't you like to, before you walk down the hall, push the button, see who you're going to walk by, and say, hey, Todd. How's Biff the dog? You know, Todd's going to, wow, this guy knows me. So that was one of the benefits, but obviously there are many other benefits to that. So I invested. I wrote a check. And so Adam went off and, and I introduced him to a bunch of different law firms and accounting firms, companies like yours, that I thought would benefit from this. And what happened was we found that it was a silo system. Companies didn't want to have this separate system on their computers for this social intranet. They wanted you to integrate it into their HR system or into the Microsoft system. And so it became really hard to sell. The sales cycles were long. Adam was the sole employee. He didn't have a lot of money. He came back to me for money, and I said, no, thank you. Uh, so we called it a day. About a year and a half later, I got a check in the mail. It was about for half of my investment. And so I called Adam. I said, Adam, where did we get the money? And he said, well, you know, I liquidated the company. I said, Adam, you were the only employee. There was one computer, one desk, and one chair. Where did all this money come from? And he said, we sold the URL, the website. And I said, who did you sell it to? And he said, the Facebook. And I said, what do they do? And he said, well, they had their exact same idea, except they're doing it at universities. They're doing the social intranet at universities. And I said, okay. So, so I said, what'd you get? And he said, I got some cash, I got some stock, and... And so I said, okay, but so nice job, buddy. Well done, thank you. About a year and a half later, I started to hear about this company called Facebook. So I called Adam back and I said, hey, Adam, how much stock did we get for this little company? And he said, gave me the number. So we were founding shareholders in Facebook by going this route. And we got a 20x return on that little investment. Now, dumb luck? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, no hero here. However, Adam had to start the company. Adam had to raise the money. Adam had to get, and by the way, he bought 20 URLs, not one. Okay, so smart thinking about him. I had to get into the game. You're not in the game, you don't have these opportunities. Anyway, so this was a, um, a nice little win, a fun story for me, and a nice outcome for a bunch of small investors. More on the reality side. When I left the Boston Consulting Group after four years, that's a very nice place, by the way. Really heady people, good business, very, very successful, smart people. But I had the entrepreneurial bug. I wanted to leave. I wanted to start a company. So I left BCG in a promising career, and I went to Transnational uh, Communications, where we were going to start a phone company because the uh, feds had deregulated the industry uh, way back when now, right? This is in the 90s. And AT&T and MCI and Sprint were forced to break up their network and sell us minutes at a discount if we committed to a lot of minutes. So we committed to a lot of minutes, several million dollars a year over three years, and we bought minutes at 11 cents. This was unheard of. This is back when you were paying 25 cents a minute to make a phone call and people were going, mom, 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 bye, you know, and hanging up real fast. You don't do that anymore. You used to do that. And so we said, geez, 11 cents a minute. We're going to go out and we're going to sell it for 17 cents a minute. How smart is that? It's great margin. It's going to be a great discount. So we went out there and it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Best business I ever started. It's like calling you up and saying, hey, Susan, how would you like to have exactly what you have now on the exact same network with the exact same product for 25% less? And I was like, you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm sure. So I hired as many salespeople and telemarketers as I possibly could, and we started growing this business, and suddenly we were 5 million, and suddenly we were 10 million. And then what happened? The death of the 17 cent minute. Other people said, huh, that's a good idea. Suddenly there were 900 other companies, not nine, 900 other companies did the same thing as we did. And they started pricing it at 16 cents a minute and 50. Suddenly it was 12 cents a minute. And we're like, holy crap, what are we going to do here? Are we going to fold up shop? And so we said, no, let's get away for a couple of days and think about what we can do with this situation. The rates are coming way down. Is there a way we can differentiate this commodity product and create something that's of greater value than just a minute? And so we came up with the idea to basically mimic what people had done in the credit card industry, affinity credit cards, affinity uh, services, and we decided to create the affinity phone company. What does that mean? That means that we go out and sell to groups and associations, the National Wildlife Federation, 
Harvard alumni, the Bowl, American Bowling Congress, two million members, by the way. There's thousands of these associations. And the pitch was, I'm going to get you non-dues revenues, and I'm going to give a benefit for your members, and I'm just going to take a little pitch in between. So we went out to these organizations, and we said, we're going to offer your membership a 20% discount off of their phone service. We're going to brand it with your name. We're going to uh, give you 2% of every one of the billings. We're going to treat them well, and everybody wins. And so they said, that's a great idea. So we created this affinity phone company. So it's a great idea, but what, practically speaking, has to happen to make that change? And here's what had to happen. We moved from direct telephone sales to group sales. Guess what? Direct telephone sales are guys in shorts and, and T-shirts at an office on a telephone banging out off of list. The group sales, jacket, tie, Washington, D.C., committees, presentations, proposals. Different set of people. Okay, So good idea. We had to change our staff. Every single time we pivot, there are some very painful things that have to happen. In this particular case, we had a laugh in order to restart our business. We had a couple of million dollars left in the bank. That's a lot of money, right? So why spend it down? Let's recreate ourselves. But I just want to point out that these things aren't always uh, easy and beautiful. So we went to group sales, advertising to direct mail. Price, we went from price, selling price, to benefits. This is like critically important for most of your businesses as well, and it works if done well. And we went from telecom speak to cause speak. Here's an example. This is an example of my phone company way back then, Sprint Communications, sending me an overdue notice. I'm, I'm late by two days. Thanks for being a loyal customer for the past 20 years, but if you don't pay your bill in five days, we're going to shut you off. Right? Very similar. They still do it today, by the way. Right? Have a nice day. Our late notices? Dear Susan, we haven't received your monthly bill in just two days. The National Wildlife Federation will lose your valuable donation and with it, your chance to help raise $50,000 to save the bison. And then we talk about the bison. This isn't phone service. This is about saving the bison, right? And so this, this is what we did for our late notice. Guess what the second late notice said? The same thing with one bison on it. <laughs> the third late notice, which was voted down by the management committee, had a bison laying on his side. That didn't, that didn't go out. But what happened with this new approach and this new strategy and this value-based, cause-based selling method, our acquisition cost for a customer went from 95 bucks to 50 bucks, lower than AT&T's acquisition cost with their brand and their power. Bad debt, that, that late notice, it worked. Bad debt went from 3% to less than 1%. Churn went from 2% to 1%. Huge, as you know, in all of your businesses. And the price per minute, we raised it from 17 cents to 20, nobody cared. The more money to the group, the better, right? So this is what we created by way of an economic shift due to that strategy change. And we went in four years from zero to $50 million in revenue, a couple hundred employees, number 12 on the Inc. 500 list, and the business eventually grew to $100 million in revenue. So bad thing happened, the death of the 17 cent minute, we pivoted to a value-based proposition, very different business, but in the same category, and we ended up winning uh, based on that pivot. If we hadn't pivoted, this never would have happened, okay? One example, Winston says, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So Faxnet, my next company, the phone company for your fax, what a stupid idea that sounds like, doesn't it, today? Back then, though, this is late 90s, um, the fax business was ignored. AT&T had a $20 billion fax business, and they didn't even really know about it. They didn't know which line in the wall was a voice line, which was a fax line. And I knew this because I had run transnational communications. And so we said, geez, if we could just be the fax, the phone company for your fax, is there a way that we could not only discount that minute way below where they could, because they couldn't differentiate between the two. So they couldn't price here one way and here another way. So that was interesting. The giant couldn't do that. Plus, fax traffic only goes one way. So it's automatically half the cost. Voice, you need to keep the, keep the line open twice. So automatically, you're 50% cheaper, OK? Plus, fax doesn't have to get there right away. 
You push the button, I wait a few seconds to optimize the traffic flow, it's another 30% savings. So we had a 90% savings by going this way. And we could add features and functions that you can't offer if you don't know if it's going to be a fax or voice call. Never busy fax. So if your fax machine was busy, we held it and we kept pinging your machine until it was free so you never had to worry. Send and forget. Same way the other direction, confidential facts. If I want to send Susan you a job offer, I would just write confidential on the cover page. Our technology would recognize that and send Susan a fax saying, you have a confidential fax waiting for you because I don't want the job offer sitting on the SBN fax machine, SBN fax machine. You would dial a number and the fax would automatically come through. So all of these things, these features and functions we could add by just focusing on fax traffic made a lot of sense. So we got into business. We raised $4 million. We went out there selling. We, we sold 5,000 small businesses on this new idea. And what happened? The one account model broke. What's the one account model? That, that's sort of all those numbers I just showed you for transnational added up. How much does it cost to acquire the customer? How much revenue do you get? What's your margin? What's the churn? What's the bad debt? How long do they stick around? And so forth, right? And we had a model that said it was going to be about $100 acquisition cost, $100 average bill, 80% margin, and so forth. And they all were just a little shy of assumptions. Didn't mean it wasn't a profitable customer, but it meant we would have had to raise $50 million to, to build this business. That's all my equity is gone. That's the reason I'm in this game. So we had to shift. And so what we did is we said, who can sell at a much more compelling price? Who has the brand? Who already sends a bill? Bills, by the way, when you send them out, three bucks a bill to send out a bill. Uh, the phone companies do. So we said, how about if we went to these phone companies that we just thought we were sly and getting around, and we did a deal with them, so we're focusing on the fax traffic, they focus on the voice traffic. And so I put on my best suit, and I flew around the country, and I visited back then with the RBOX, the regional bell operating companies that you're all familiar with from the past, and we got a deal with US West. And because we got the deal with US West, we got the deal with Bell South. When we, once we got the deal with Bell South, we went forward and forward. And so we were the white label provider of these fax services behind the telcos. But what does that mean for the operation? Telesales to small businesses, again, to telco sales. The sales cycle is a little bit different, right? This is like a one call and you're done. That's a pregnancy plus, right, by way of time frame, nine months plus. Regular sales to lumpy sales. You know, every week I would be measuring my sales when I was FaxNet. This was like one deal closes a year. You get, you get an Ameritech or a Verizon or today um, uh, all these bigger companies, it takes a long time to do that. Fax to fax to fax to email, we came up with a new concept, which was really nice. We went from brand, we were going to build this FaxNet brand to white label. All these things are really different by way of business strategy. And by the way, we were able, with this strategy, to do deals with international phone companies, and we wouldn't have really been able to get into the retail business internationally then. So it gave us that opportunity that we didn't have before, and we took advantage of that. So the results of that pivot and what we were able to do by getting all of the telcos, we won the space. We got every single telco in the country to sign up for us and we started to go international all within a couple of years. Uh, we went from zero to $30 million in three and a half years. We signed uh, international carriers. Argentina ended up being 25% of the sales. Argentina, Buenos Aires is a very nice place, by the way, if you haven't been down there. We raised $20 million and we sold the company for $210 million the year later. So again, from a place of, holy crap, what are we going to do? The model's broken. This isn't going to happen to, let's see if we can get creative. Look at the assets that you have, because you have a lot of good assets, and recreate them and reposition them in a way that can create a business. I'm not saying never give up, but I'm just saying there are ways to pivot oftentimes using the assets that you have. Winston again, success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. Another great quote, I think. Carbonite. Many of you have heard of Carbonite partly because I, we won the award here five, five or six years ago. But the original idea for Carbonite that you won't hear except in this room was to back up digital photos on your PC for only $1 per gigabyte per month. And we had a little dancing purple lock icon on the website. Very cool. Designed by the founder's son. right? So really modern web 2.0. And what happened was we went out and we struck deals with Nikon and we struck deals with Staples and we were going to like attach to the camera and we were going to back up these photos. And what we discovered was that our two largest competitors ended up being fear and apathy. I'll talk more about that. And this is often the case when you're in businesses where you're dealing with people's personal data. 
People don't know what a gigabyte is. We're selling the product for $1 a gigabyte. Nobody knew what that meant. How, how many pictures is in a gigabyte? Is that, what is that, five or five million, right? So we said, geez, that's, that's interesting. We knew what a gigabyte was, but most of the people didn't. And there were all these other things, Mac, iTunes, and iPhones that were coming up and becoming more important, and we were just like backing up stuff on your PC. So we had a problem. So what did we decide to do? We said, look it, how about if we just back up everything on every device for one fixed price, push the button and it works, right? Big change in our business model from going after photos and distribution through photo uh, shops and going direct to consumer. And so what did that mean? We had to take the dancing lock icon off the website because nobody trusted that. If you're going to send me your bank records, your kids' photos, and all the other stuff you have on your computer, you want to make sure it's secure. So we rebranded ourselves more like Iron Mountain than the dance, dancing lock icon. We went from $1 per gigabyte per month to unlimited. I don't care how much stuff you have. Don't worry about how big it is. Send it to me, and it's $55 a year. That's it. Now, we were going to lose on some people because there are some video files in this room that take videos every day and have several terabytes worth of data, but that's okay. On average, we did the math and we thought we could win. So our average storage actually more than doubled, and that's a cost for us. This, this thing called the cloud, most of you know, is actually a lot of hardware in a building in the not-so-nice area of town with air conditioning running 24-7 and guards and no windows, right? That's the cloud, right? That's actually costly. We went from partner marketing to direct response. We signed 30 partners to start this thing with the photo stuff. I had to go and unsign 30 partners because our business model has changed. That's harder, actually, than that. There were people that weren't happy with that change for us. From features to selling on fear, you don't want to lose your photos. Todd, you do not want your wife coming home and you say, I'm sorry, I lost the wedding photos, the kids' photos, the bank records. I'm sorry, honey. You don't want to do that. So we started playing on that fear because it's real. Everybody in this room has a story now of losing some stuff, right? If you don't have carbonite, you're going to lose some stuff. So anyway, we went to all devices and we made this change. As part of trying to uh, shift um, our, our strategy to overcome the fear and apathy, we went to trusted um, celebrities, right? And we went to both sides of the aisle. I went to the Super Bowl with Rush Limbaugh. I went down and hung out with Howard Stern. Two different guys, right? <laughs> Laura Ingram, Bill O'Reilly. So anyway, so we went and we wrote checks to these people. And uh, they got on the air and said, look, at, we use it because they all did uh, after I had that visit. And um, they helped us to sell. And so the sales started going through the roof. This was to address the fear side of things. Is this OK for me to do? When Rush Limbaugh, despite what you might think about his politics, says, do it, about 20 million people try. And we got really simple. Again, $55 a year, unlimited backup space, completely automatic, installs with just an email and a password, always on, set and forget, don't worry about it, no gigabyte thing. We put little dots on your files, greened when it's backed up, yellow when it's in process, no dot if it's not backed up. And we patented that, by the way. I know there's an IP attorney I was talking to earlier. We patented that thing. And if the green uh, lock icon on the bottom is green, you're good. Right, simple, simple, simple. That's what we did. We dumbed it down here. And we sold um, uh, fear. We sold on fear. We changed our uh, marketing strategy. And what happened, um, most of you know the Carbonate story there. We got over a million customers in four years. It was a lot of fun after that shift. Went to over 60 million in bookings in that time. Number nine on the Inc. 500 list, climbing the ladder. We raised $65 million and the company went public uh, in 2011 and remains there. You probably hear it every once in a while on NPR, still advertising our wares. Harder market today, by the way. Apple's giving it away. Google's giving it away. Everybody's giving it away. So they can read your stuff, by the way, and, uh, and market to you. Uh, so anyway, so that's another uh, pivot that we chose at the right time, I think, and, uh, and led the market uh, into that level of success. A um, couple of other companies I'll mention, and then I'm going to show you a video. Raypoint was a reputation management company. Basically, you could come, put your business uh, name and address in, push the button, and our bots would go out to the internet and find everything that's written about you, evaluate it, actually evaluate it, and give you a score, much like your DMB credit score. It was a really good idea. And so we thought every small business wants to know what their reputation management score is, right? Restaurants, brick and mortars type places. And so we started to put that out there. 
and you could for free see what your score was, and then if you want to sign up, we'd monitor it for you. Anytime it changed to the negative, would ping you and let you know, and would advise you and help you as to how to get it better. Right? Not a bad idea, but what happened was, if it's not on the top 10 list for small businesses, it's not going to get done. And so we just found it was too hard to sell. And so we came up with an idea saying, hey, look it, if we took all this data, which is mainly written by people who are interacting with the business, and we said, if that's going down, like people are starting to have bad experiences, and your score goes from 800 to 700 to 600, there's probably a problem in that business. What can we do with that data, right? The business doesn't want to buy it. We tried that. How about if we sell it to banks? How about if we sell it to rating agencies? And so we got on our horse and we went out and started to work with them to say, we're going to be able to predict a business problem six months before it happens. Because if you're a restaurateur, before you miss your rent payment, before you miss your payment on your stove, you're cutting staff, you're cutting hours, you're stressed out, the food quality is going to get down a little bit. That stuff shows up online. And so we were able to begin to predict that. It was very exciting. So we ended up selling this to a company called Conotate. And then I took over as CEO of Conotate. Conotate did tools for web data aggregation at scale. And so we had this massive web scraper. Okay, So if you're um, uh, Thomson Reuters and you want to provide data products to millions of people, you use our technology to go get that data from around the world on every website, put it in an orderly fashion uh, so that you can do a great product. What we found was that people didn't want the product. It was too hard to use. They just wanted the data. So we, turned, we pivoted into a data products company. So Thomson Reuters would come to me and say, here's the data I want. You go get it for me. Right? Big shift from a product software company to a services company. Right? So we did that, and the company is uh, still running, uh, hopefully successful, because I had a little interest there, uh, in New Jersey. And lastly, Constant Therapy. This is the company I'm with right now uh, to finish off. Our goal is to revolutionize the treatment of neurological disorders. We use science-based digital brain therapy provided on mobile devices like an iPad to help people that have had a stroke or a traumatic brain injury recover their cognitive and speech capability, and it works. It's unbelievable, and it works. But the healthcare market is so hard. You know, I want to sell you a product right here, and it's a beautiful product. It's this thing. And I have it, and it's, it's better and less expensive. And in the healthcare market, you'd like him to pay for it, and you'd like him to deliver it to you. And I'm like, who are those other people? And why are they in the room? Right? That's the healthcare market, right? So I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't know what the pivot is going to be, if any, uh, but I do want to show you a little video. My name is Mary Borelli. A simple introduction. M-A-R-Y. That requires a lot of hard work. And on January 28th, 2010, I had the stroke. My uh, arteries and veins burst in my head, and I had a brain bleed. The damage to the left side of Mary's brain was devastating. She couldn't move her right arm and leg, and she couldn't speak. That was the time that I realized that, wow, I really have something wrong with me. Mary was diagnosed with aphasia, a communication disorder most often caused by strokes. Patients lose their ability to talk, listen, read, or write. The brain tries to reach into its store of words um, and sentences and comes up empty. Swathi Kiran is a professor at Boston University and directs the school's aphasia research laboratory. The more you can intensively promote and exercise the brain, the more likely you're going to see gains. Rehabilitation usually involves working directly with a clinician on specialized tasks designed to help relearn language skills. But Kiran and her team developed an app called Constant Therapy that allows patients to continue this intensive work at home. Please listen to the following voicemail and answer the associated questions. And allows clinicians to track their patients' progress as they identify sounds, repeat words, and even listen to a sequence of instructions. Congratulations, you have completed your tasks. I didn't know how much of a godsend it was gonna be. I could talk into it and then uh, play it back and hear my voice. Using constant therapy almost daily, Mary has regained her speech, her confidence, and her place in the classroom. I think that I am doing very well.
I would say so. Good for her. That was Heather Unruh reporting. Professor Kieran says data from the app is already changing the way researchers think about brain recovery. She said it's never too late to start speech therapy. Even people who suffered a stroke more than 10 years ago should see some improvement. So I was on Channel 5 two nights ago. So I just uh, incorporated it into the presentation today. So that's what we do today. That's constant therapy. So uh, that's all I have to talk about today. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It was a lot of fun. So the app is free if you're a clinician. So if you're treating patients, it's absolutely free for you. They helped us to build it, and that's one of our commitments over time. If you are a, a patient that wants to use it out of the clinic, it's a subscription for $20 a month. It's not today reimbursed by that guy. Yeah, each company's been different, and uh, I did a web analytics company in between this. Uh, I ran a company up in Ottawa, Canada. Um, this is a lot of data uh, by way of its focus. We've uh, served over 25 million brain exercises in the last two years, collected over 250 million data points. That data we use to optimize the therapy delivery. So we know, based on that data, what works and what doesn't for different types of people. So when you come into the product, you put in a little uh, registration information on your demographic and diagnosis and what happened to you, and the technology automatically looks into our database and say, who, who looked like that before and what worked for them and that's what you get served up and then it it, it observes you over time and keeps adjusting uh, to your level of capability so it's a lot about data it's a lot about technology I guess the common theme would be technology disrupting um, industries that exist this is a hard one though healthcare is hard right it's been so ingrained there's so much money there's so much incentive for people not to change that it's hard uh, right now so uh, we're doing our best to help people like Mary uh, regain their skills Uh, one is um, uh, uh, team building, right, and team uh, hiring good people, right, because at the end of the day, after you have a decent idea and a decent market uh, that you can get into, it's all about the people, right? And we all know about this. You hear about it. Get the right people on the bus. Get the wrong people off the bus. That's critical, right? And you have to be really good at that. Number two is sort of coaching and team building. I've always liked that. I've been an athlete and, and a team member for many, many types of teams. That's why I'm involved, still involved with uh, Harvard Rugby. So that's really important as you grow a company. And then at the end of the day, you've got to know your numbers. Right? You got to know, if you, if you don't know your numbers, you're not going to know when to pivot. So I think uh, being analytical, paying attention to, and measuring everything that you possibly can is another common theme uh, among companies. Yeah, so definitely um, it's, it's not a, a solo uh, effort, the pivot process. Really good question. Um, most oftentimes, uh, it's been at times when we've already got investors and board members that are outside of the company. And so, you know, you sort of do the O-S-H-I-T, oh, something's happening here, do we really want to tell our board right now? So you get together as a management team, sometimes for um, hours, sometimes for days, to try to f figure out what the new plan might be. And then you've got to go to your board and say, hey, look at guys, not quite what we anticipated. Uh, you know, we've seen some of this coming before. We give you a couple of heads up, but here's the new plan. What do you think? And so then it becomes a board discussion, a money discussion, investor discussion, because the plan has to make sense financially for the investors. Otherwise, they won't uh, buy in. <laughs>